let's go ahead and get started. Um, there's probably going to be a couple more people show up at some point, but do I look worried? No, I'm not worried. All right, so today um, we're going to go over some basic table saw safety and we're going to talk a little bit about tenons on the table saw type of stuff because tomorrow will be a quiz on table saw safety. It's five questions like my quizzes usually are and there's help for those of you that don't seem to be able to figure it out, okay? Um, and that is in the form of so if you go to today's module for Tuesday the 16th I don't know why these little numbers show up it's annoying there is it says that with today we'll be going over table, table saw safety you'll take a quiz on the table saw tomorrow okay and there's a little document right here that you can click on and it'll open up but if you go back to the modules Wednesday, tomorrow, today you're taking a quiz covering the table saw. The document linked below will help you with the quiz. It is the same document, all right? And that is right here, okay? It's got an image of our table saw with some basic terms such as the rip fence, a miter gauge, the lock handle for the rip fence, the blade height adjustment wheel, the blade angle adjustment wheel and the start stop switch. Okay, just the basics, the absolute basics. And then you just need to memorize all of this stuff, right? No, you don't. Um, basically what you'll see is the highlighted items. There just so happen to be one, two, three, four, five highlighted items on this document. And what do you know, there's five questions on the quiz, okay? So if you're a thinking person, which there's probably a few of you that are, and there's probably a few of you that are not, but if you are a thinking person, you already know that, well, I'm gonna guess that the five questions on the quiz are these five highlighted items. For example, the table saw is the machine of choice for rip cuts. And a rip cut is one that cuts along the length of a board, altering its overall width in the process, okay? Um, your board must be at least 12 inches long in order to rip it to final width on the table saw. Any board less than 12 inches long cannot be ripped on the table saw. It's too short. Hold on, I got a slacker coming in late here. Let's see what's going on. Oh, come on, I'm trying to get... Okay, five. Okay, if the fence is set at four inches or closer to the blade, you must use a push stick. Okay, next one, always place the long jointed edge of your material against the fence when ripping. Placing the long edge against the fence when ripping is basically the definition of a ripping operation. In other words, altering or changing the overall width of a board. So if you've got a board that's 24 inches long and six inches wide, you would rip it to five inches wide, four inches wide, three inches wide, whatever width you need, but it would, would remain 24 inches long. Changing the length is a cross cut, and we do that at the miter saw, correct? Of course it's correct. How do you know it's correct? I just told you it is. Um, it is your responsibility to make sure that the machine is adjusted properly before you use it. Those include things like the blade height being set correctly so that the blade itself is approximately one quarter of an inch above the upper surface of the material. The blade angle is 90 degrees to the table. The rip fence is set and locked. In other words, that'll get out of the way. That little handle is down, locked, okay? Um, all sorts of different things you need to check to make sure that the machine is set up properly before you use it. That goes for any machine in this shop. It's your responsibility. If you are the one using it, it is your responsibility to ensure that it is adjusted properly. That does not mean that you cannot ask for help from me in getting a machine set up properly. That's a big portion of my job is making sure that the machine is going to make the cut that you want it to make, okay? 
it would be impossible for me to teach all of you every little intricacy in setting up a particular machine in here for a particular cut. So that's one of the things I do is I help you guys set those up. Okay. Um, there are, is a lot more very, very important information embedded in this. And it's some of the things that we would cover in more depth were you physically here. Um, and I also today, I will probably hit on a few of these things as I'm talking just because, just because, okay. So we're going to stop this sharing thing and go back to the table saw. Um, it depends. In advance, you should be able to set the angle of the blade. Um, depending on, well, yeah, you should absolutely be able to set the angle of the blade. We actually have a little digital angle gauge that allows you to magnetically attach this little box to the blade so that as you angle it, you get the exact angle within a degree or a little less than a degree, half a degree. So yeah, you should be able to do that. It's not rocket science, it's not hard. Um, so yeah, all right, so um, let's get down to this, okay? So the table saw, as previously mentioned, is the machine of choice for ripping lumber to final width. As a matter of fact, in my beginning classes, this is pretty much the only thing students do on this machine is rip to final width width okay they generally don't do much else with this machine than that and the more i've thought about it over the course of the morning the more i realized that for the most part even in intermediate and advanced woods the main function of this machine for all of you is ripping to final width in other words taking a board such as this right and making a rip cut running it this way okay so that you know if I ever see a student trying to do a cross cut like this using the fence, assuming I catch them in the act, you're not going to be a very happy person because I'm a very unhappy person. If I do not catch you in the act, I'll find out because you'll probably be lying on the floor in pain because a kickback caught you right here. Okay, so that is a very, very bad situation. We do not cross cut using a rip fence. They are two completely different processes, okay? Hold on, there's somebody coming in late again. Frustrating. All right, so blade set, a quarter inch above your material. The long jointed edge of the board must be against the fence. In other words, at the absolute least, you have to have a jointed edge up against the fence, and you have to have a planed or joint, I'm sorry, a jointed face down on the table. This table is a known entity, it's perfectly flat. This fence is a known entity, it's perfectly flat. So you can't put something against the fence. that is not perfectly flat. This way, you can't go the right way that time. I'm gonna move this so you can see it. Hopefully. If this board is not perfectly flat, here's what happens. Let me back this out a little bit so you can see it. Or here's what can happen. You'll notice the leading edge of this board is not touching the fence. There's a gap, okay? I'm pushing at the back, putting it tight against the fence back here, which causes a gap to be created at the front. At the front, if I push, look what happens at the back, okay? In other words, this board's gonna rock as it goes through here. We can't have that. You have to have a flat, straight edge against the fence, okay? We're going to put a known surface, a nice flat jointed edge against a known surface, a nice flat fence. We're gonna put a nice flat face, jointed face, a known surface on the nice flat table, which is also a known surface. And we're gonna keep it tight there, okay? So 
simple ripping operation. All right. Some of the other things this machine can do and that we use on a regular basis, well, I shouldn't say regular basis, but we do use it. For example, we do a lot of miter cuts on this machine, 45 degree cuts, and I'll tell you why. Okay, we have what's known what's called a miter sled, all right? And it drops right into these miter slots, and it allows us to do very accurate miters, even more accurate than, say, the miter saw, okay? And I'll show you what I'm talking about. So basically what we can do with the miter sled that we have a difficult time doing with the miter saw. Let's say, for example, we know exactly where we want to make a cut. We know the exact length of our board for a miter cut. I'm going to do it halfway down here so you can see it. And there's our mark. With, with a setup like this, it's really easy to lay that mark on our curve line. I went the wrong way again. And I'm going to see, see if you guys can see this. All right. So what we have here is this gap right here and this gap right here was created by this blade. In other words, one edge of the gap matches with this side of the blade. The other edge of the gap pairs up with this side of the blade. So all I really have to do is take my pencil mark that you can see right there and set it right on that edge. Okay, basically all I've done is set my pencil mark right there, right onto the edge of this curve. So that when I make a cut, look at where it's cutting. So I can dial in my miter cuts really tight on this. You can actually see, I haven't moved this board yet. Let's see if this thing will zoom in anymore. You can actually see, I can just barely see that my pencil mark is still there. You can kind of see it, right? I had set that right on that curve. And here's the nice thing about it, that we have a hard time getting with the miter saw sometimes. When I put this together, I should have cut 245s, right? And that would mean that when I put them together, here, let me get this out of the way, I should have a 90 degree angle. On the miter saw, that can be difficult to do because that miter saw is just used and abused. It's adjustable in so many different ways that it tends to go out of adjustment very easily. And what I should have a perfect 90 degrees, which I do. That's a dead on perfect 90 degree cut. Okay, so we can get a lot more accurate using that sled than we can with our miter saw. That's one of the things we do on this on a regular basis. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. I got another person coming in late and I know this person. This person is late seemingly a lot. So let's see. 15 minutes late. There you go, Strangquist. Slacker. Okay. Other things that we do on the table saw, or that we can do on the table saw. Um, one of the things that we regularly do in here are called mortise and tenon joints. Okay. So basically, what that is, it's taking a square hole or a mortise, right, and creating a square tenon on the end that will fit in that mortise. Okay. Now, we can do this in a number of different ways. All right. Commonly, we do it on the dado saw. And honestly, the more I think about it, the biggest reason for that is because the dado saw does not get as much constant use as the table saw. 
So oftentimes it's the machine that's three, that is free and available for use. Um, so we just tend to go to the dado saw, but there are ways to do tenons on the table saw that are super simple and accurate. Okay. So we'll talk about that real quick. All right. First things first, once you have your mortise cut, okay, the mortise is generally 90% of the time done first. Then you cut the tenon to match or fit the mortise. It's a lot easier to work with a tenon to make it fit than it is to work with a mortise to make it fit. Okay. So once we've got our mortise and we've drawn our tenon on our board, anytime you do any type of joinery in here, yeah, I went the right way that time. You have to have it drawn on your material. You have to know where you're going with it. Let me show you kind of why that is. You can see what I have here is I have the shoulders marked that are coming off all the way around the board, okay? And I can see the tenon that's gonna remain afterwards, all right? So basically, um, I've marked them. After I mark them, I like to check them against the existing mortise. So I can actually set this here and see how closely, whoop, I'm going the wrong way, my lines, here line up with my mortise. They should match in that dimension and in the thickness of the tenon itself. Okay, they should match. All right. Now, one of the things we like to do on tenons that we like to do on some other types of cuts, like dados and rabbits, things like that, <clears throat> we like to sneak up on the cuts. In other words, the last thing I want to do is try and nail this tenon perfectly the very first time. It doesn't work that way. Usually when you're doing mortise and tenon, you're doing more than a single one. You're doing multiples of two or four, okay? So we like to sneak up on a cut. In other words, get close to where we wanna be, right? Get just close to it, then test fit it, and then start taking a little bit more off with each subsequent try. We don't want to try and nail it the first time. We're going to end up taking too much off and it's going to be a sloppy fit. So here's one way we can do that. The first thing I want to do, and it's not necessarily, it doesn't have, necessarily have to be the very first thing, but it makes sense. One of the things we have to remember about tenons, okay, we're not cutting all the way through the board. So we cannot use the riving knife. It has to come off. Now, you may say, but Brandon, that's unsafe. Um, not necessarily, because this is not a situation where we're concerned about a kickback. We're not removing pieces right now. And we're, even if we were removing pieces, we're not removing a piece that's going to be in a situation where it's caught between something that's moving and something that's not, like the fence. Okay, so let me show you what I'm talking about. So the first thing I want to do is I want to set up the length of the tenon and a close approximation of the depth of this cut. Okay, in other words, that deep. I'm going to set the blade height first, simply by really, I'm going to zoom this in so you guys can see a little bit. All I'm really going to do is I'm going to set my board right here. I'll do it on this side so you guys can see it. Whenever you set, whenever you set a blade height like this, the, the height itself is part of the cut. In other words, you're not cutting all the way through something. If you're cutting a dado or a rabbit or something like this, or you're, you're doing a tenon, you always want to raise the blade to the height. In other words, what I never want to do is lower the blade to my final height. Okay. What I want to do is I want to go below where I need to be. Then I want to bring the blade up to my final height. And it's difficult sometimes to tell where the top of the rotation is, okay? But there we go, that's about where I wanna be. I don't know if you guys can see that, but that's about where I wanna be. So I've got my blade height. Now I wanna set how far up the length of the board I wanna cut. And since we cannot use the fence and the miter gauge at the same time, when making a cut, 
what we have to do is that a little temporary fence there. So all I've done is clamped a piece of material right here so that when I make my cut, I'm not in contact with the fence or with this, okay? So here's how I'm gonna set this up. I'm gonna bring this right up to the blade. Okay, and I'm gonna line this up right where I want, right to the length of my tenon, okay? So now my blade is lined up so the left edge of the blade is even with this line, all right? So I've got that set. I'm holding it nice and snug. I'm gonna bring the fence over to it and lock it down, okay? And I'm also going to take and double check it. I'm gonna pull my board away from the stop, slide it back up to the stop, run it back to the blade and check it. Okay, so now I know that's where I want it to be. Okay. Exactly, exactly. What, what Josh has said is absolutely true, okay? So we make our cheek cut, okay? We do that one. We do that one. So here's the cuts I have, all right? Now what we wanna do is we wanna go ahead and make this cut. That's nothing more than changing the height of the blade. We're using the same stop, okay? We want these, we want these cuts to follow their way all around, or all, around, geez, all around the board perfectly. So all I have to do is raise my blade a little bit And I'm gonna go shy of the line because I do not want to take off too much. All right, so I've got that set. Now all I have to do is put the board up on edge. So there's my cut all the way around the tenon. Okay, piece of cake, piece of cheese. All right, next, we have options for the next part, but probably in my mind, the most accurate way to do this, and I actually kind of enjoy using it, it's called a tinning jig. And it's this guy right here. Now it slides into the miter slot, just like the miter gauge does. It's got a little slide right here that sits right into the miter slot. Okay, and here we go. So what we have is a situation where we can have two things that are square. This surface here should be 90 degrees to the table. It looks like it is. Also, there's a little guy back here, right here, that should be 90 degrees to the table. And it is almost this the reason these can be adjusted is so you can do angled tenons things like that wow i just i messed it up more let's get it nice and tight there we go all right so that's got it now the cool thing about this is i've got a little lock right here okay and i've got a little lock right here and I've got this little dial guide thing here. Let me show you what I'm talking about, why this is so cool. So I can take this thing, put it in here, and I just clamp it in place. Now, let me show you what this does. Shoot, you're gonna have a real hard time seeing it, so I'll kind of show you this way. Okay, so basically I'm gonna clamp it in place, then I'm gonna bring it forward, okay? Then I can, using this little dial knob, I can dial this right over. I'm gonna I'm gonna zoom in just a little more. Hopefully you guys can see that. If it will zoom in more, it will. And it'll back it out. So I'll start with this little re right up against the blade. And then all I have to do is oops, slide it the wrong way. Slide this over. 
until I get it right where I want it. And I'm going to leave it a little bit fat. I want to leave that just a little bit thicker than I need. Now that I've got it in, oh, I messed up. I got to set blade height. All I have to do is set this right next to it. Here, I'll do it this way so you guys can see. That blade height. And I'm going to raise it to my height. My height. Okay. So put it in, clamp it, <coughs> and see what happens. Let's see what our fit looks like so far. Okay, there's our mortise. Okay. Now our tenon should be a little too thick. So you guys should be able to see that that's how much too thick it is. Okay, so all I have to do, bring this up here and just shift it over a little bit. This allows you to really dial it in nicely. Okay, let's try that. I'm just going to take a little more. I'd rather make three or four passes to get this right than screw it up in the first pass. Take a little bit off, and you have to take the same amount off both sides. Does that stop? Let's see what we've got here. getting close at this point I can actually get it to go in there and and let go at this point I may stop and finish off using a chisel or a hand plane to get it just right no I would not want to use I'm really glad you said that the last thing in the world I'd want to do to get this to fit would be to use sandpaper that would be bad and the reason for that is I can't sand flat straight and square it is impossible i don't care how good you think you are it's not going to happen okay um i can chisel a heck of a lot flatter and straighter and squarer than i can sand and i can certainly use a hand plane especially one that looks like this okay let me back this out a little bit because the blade on this comes all the way to the edge of the sole. That means that when I hand plane this, I'm hand planing all the way up to the shoulder. Now you may also notice that I've got a little, I've got a little lip right here. Okay, that's a piece of cake. Easy. That doesn't bother me one bit. Because I can take a chisel. All right, I can take a chisel, and especially since this is pine, that makes it a lot easier. I'm gonna do final cleanup of this with a chisel anyway. Okay, and I just clean that off pretty easy. You can see I've got it going all the way around. So I could go ahead, and I think I will go ahead and take just another hair off this. Actually, yeah because I don't want to sit here and do it with a hand plane right now. So we're just going to, I mean, just barely moved it. And let's see what that does. That sounds like it's going to be pretty good. Stop. Here's my mortise. There's my fit. That's what I want right there. Okay, that fits really good. Now you'll notice I've still got these little ears on here. Okay, most of the time what I do is just go to the bandsaw. Right, I finish up on the bandsaw and I just take off 
that little guy and that little guy in the bandsaw. Um, I'd get close to where I want to be. I'd stay a little bit outside, then I'd just use a chisel to pair it. Now, the thing about this is, is oftentimes you'd like to see the mortise or the tenon be able to shift in this mortise just a little bit this way and this way. Now, most of that goes towards students' inability to get things perfectly accurate. Um, if I was doing a fine piece of furniture, I'd want this tenon dead on. But for you guys, nine to, and it's, even if I'm just working on cabinetry stuff or something that's going in the garage, I want this tenon to shift this way or this way in the mortise. So that, especially if I'm at the top, like a rail on a cabinet, I want this to be able to shift just a little bit so I can get it perfectly even and flush. So if I have to shift it down a little bit to get it flush, or I have to shift it up a little bit to get it flush, I want to be able to do that. Okay, so that's kind of another thing we can do with the table saw is tenons. Um, like I said, we can also do them on the dado saw. That's just as easy to do them on the dado saw. Um, and usually there's not a line at the dado saw. Sometimes there is, usually there's not, and you can usually get to the dado saw. Um, and it actually takes fewer cuts on the dado saw. And a lot of times, the fewer number of cuts, the less chance there is to screw up. But I've always found that this little, this little uh, tenoning jig works really well. And it, it's great if you're doing a lot of tenons. Um, it works pretty well. And I think I can do a more accurate job using this than I can the dado saw. So it's just one of those things. I don't want it to be loose. I don't want it to be able to shift in here this way. But there are times when I would prefer it can shift this way a little bit, or even a hair this way. Um, and I, I'm going to have a really hard time explaining that. But the tiniest little ability to shift will allow you to square something up. Um, it should be square. And that's one of the nice things about doing it this way is that keeps it really square. As long as this surface right here is 90 degrees to the edges, which this allows it to be so, that's going to be square because those shoulders are what's going to square it. You can kind of see that it's going to lock right up to those shoulders. So these last couple parts would be taken off with, that's a nice fit. So if I can get that tenon in there and just, I can't put it all the way in because I don't have those wings off yet, but that's a good fit. Okay. Another one other little thing that you do to make sure you do is the mortise. Let's say this mortise was three quarters of an inch deep. I'd want to keep that tenon about a sixteenth of an inch shy of three quarters. In other words, I want some place at the bottom of the mortise for glue to cool. If the length of this tenon is exactly the same as the depth of the mortise, then if you know anything about hydraulics, as you force it in, if you've got glue in here, as you force it in, that glue can't, it's like water can't be compressed. Fluids can't be compressed. So it's gonna, once it gets down there to the bottom, if there's glue pool in the bottom of it, it's gonna wanna force it back out. So um, always leave the mortise a little bit deeper than the length of the tenon for glue to pool at the bottom. Um, can't think of much else. Uh, yeah, I'm really actually, Tyler, I don't, I don't mean to sound mean or anything like that, but I'm really glad you asked that question because this happens a lot in here, a lot. I'll see a student go over the miter saw and cut a board to what they believe is the correct length. But turns out they left it an eighth of an inch or a sixteenth of an inch too long. And instead of going back to the miter saw and just trimming just a tiny bit off of it to get it to the final length to make up that little stuff they, they missed, they go to the edge sander or one of the sanding machines and they try and just sand it off. The problem with that is sandpaper doesn't maintain flatness or squareness. You can't keep a surface perfectly flat and you can't keep a surface perfectly square with sandpaper. Whether it's on a sanding machine like the edge sander or a spindle sander or a palm sander, or whether it's a piece of sandpaper around a block of wood. Um, you cannot sand flat, straight, and square. It is not going to happen. 
okay? Even with a nice solid block of wood. And that's the thing, you can't sand flat, straight, and square. And we just took the entire week last week, or half the week last week, talking about how to get a board flat, straight, and square using the machines we have in here. And that gets boards, act, when done properly, it get, gets boards incredibly accurately, flat, straight, and square. And if you try to go and sand something, after going through all those steps and all that process, if you try and go to sand something to get it just a little bit smaller dimensionally, you've just jacked up all that work you did and trying to get it flat, straight, and square in the first part. And I see students do this all the time all the time and it's frustrating as anything because we go to so much trouble to teach you how to get something flat straight and square using the jointer the planer the table saw the miter saw that when you go to use an edge sander or a spindle sander or a band saw to, to square something it's just frustrating as all heck so please don't do that because it's gonna make me mad it's gonna upset me it's gonna disappoint me depress me your grade's gonna drop like Walmart's prices. I'm gonna be sad. Um, you're gonna produce a pile of junk, basically firewood instead of a piece of furniture. So just don't do it, okay? Um, I, hopefully it does. Yeah, that, that was the whole idea. That, that, and I think that's the first time I ever came up with that analogy that we spend so much time using the machines to get something flat, straight, and square that you could ruin it by using a sander. You notice that we haven't talked once. No, we have talked once about sanders in here, and that was just. After using the bandsaw, you would use the spindle sander to clean up any bandsaw marks. And what's the bandsaw used for? Cutting curves and shapes, okay? Not straight lines, not gonna happen. So, okay, hopefully that makes a little bit of sense to you guys. Um, that's it. Tomorrow we'll take a quick quiz. We'll move on with our lives and cruise right on into the weekend, hopefully again, all right? So you guys take care of yourselves. Have a good evening and I'll see you all tomorrow, okay? Bye-bye. Let's get Let's see here. I went the right way that time. Thank you. Right, am I working on anything personal right now? No, I'm not. Actually, I got some lumber yesterday that I may try and do a couple of these funky cutting boards for examples in the classroom. Um, and since I paid for some of it, I'll probably take one of them home if my wife wants one. But Otherwise, we'll probably just leave them here so students can see. I've, I've never done a cutting board like that before, so I thought I'd give it a try and see what, you know. Try. I want to try the, the one that has the curved inlay, and I want to try either the little zigzag one or the brick pattern. Sounds like it might be kind of fun. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I don't do a lot of cutting boards, so it's going to be interesting. In fact, I never do cutting boards. So it'll be very interesting. Hardest thing I've ever made, um, probably the entertainment center I have in my house right now. Um, it's just huge, it's, it's massive. And it's like one, two, three, four, five, it's like seven pieces that are bolted together to get it in and out of the house. So it was, that was, it was difficult just because of the, the size of it, you know, so. I got, remind me, I've got pictures of it somewhere. When you guys show up for school on the first, I'll try and I'll try and find a picture and show it to you. Absolutely, you're welcome. Have a great day. Actually, I'm going to say it on here too because I'm sure you enjoy okay. it hearing voices. Have a good day, Mr. Brandon. <laughs> Thank you. I do, actually. I never hear voices in here, so it's nice. Thank you, Sammy. All right. Bye, Mr. Brandon. Have a good Bye. day. You too.